Thank you. Oh my god. Stephanie out here. <laughs> yeah. She got you. She got Steph, you. Steph, you got you. Yeah, yeah. You're the you're you're the real hero for tonight, Stephanie. <laughs> Oh man. Okay. So, um, uh, it, I think it's recording. Yes, it is. Okay. So, um, I left you with uh, self-esteem, which, and one of the things we, one of the theories of self-esteem was, uh, was terror management theory, which basically says, uh, you know, we're all going to die and we're all trying to achieve some level of greatness before we die. You know, we're not just, we don't want to just be accepted. We want to be, you know, great. So one of the things that we do to manage our feeling of how great we are is our self-esteem. Right. And that, that the fundamental driver motivator for that is kind of our, our own our own mortality. Uh, we talked a little bit about, you know, the some of the dangers of having low self esteem. And then we talked about the super danger of having high self esteem, which is narcissism. Uh, and, you know, there's just nothing good about narcissism. There really isn't. Um, although sometimes th there are some people out there that think that um, uh, narcissism can be a useful uh, tool for leaders, for leadership. Uh, certainly some of the best leaders in history have been like horrible narcissists, you know. Um, uh, General Patton uh, from the, the World War II, George S. Patton, he was a, he was like off the charts, like wacko nutcase narcissist. And he also was probably the greatest general the U.S. has ever had. And he's the reason we won World War II basically. Um, so, you know, there's examples like that, but for the most part, they're, they're more the exception rather than the rule. We talked about self-efficacy. That is the sense that you are competent and effective in the world. And, you know, obviously having low self-efficacy, meaning that eh, I really can't do anything well is not a good thing. Um, now we're going to talk probably about the mo one of the most fundamental important concepts in social psychology and that is uh basically our self-serving bias the self-serving bias is really important for you to understand it's it's real simple by the way it's it's like dumb bone dumb simple <laughs> so it's not complicated which is nice right but you have to understand it because a lot of uh a lot of the effects that people look at in social psychology are due to the self-serving bias of course, self-serving means doing things for the benefit of myself, right? That's what the term means, self-serving, right? And that's exactly what the self-serving bias is. The self-serving bias is the tendency to perceive yourself favorably. In any situation, the tendency to perceive yourself favorably, okay? So when we're explaining positive versus negative effects, in general, most people, and this is not everybody, people, people have the self-serving bias to different degrees, right? You know, people are different, but in general, the population, when we're explaining positive and negative um, uh, events, we tend to attribute different causes to those events. So for example, right, if I got an A in a class, Right. If I got an A in a really hard class, it's like it's because I worked hard and I am a hard worker and I'm smart. And basically everything about the explanation for me getting that A in the class was because of some external, I'm sorry, some internal reason to me. Right. However, let's then I get a D in a class. Oh, well, I got a D because the professor was unfair. The tests were badly written. Uh, the, the, the time of the class was just like way too early for me. And it's, it's a subject that is like nobody likes. Right? <laughs> but yeah, look at those reasons why I got a D, right? The reasons I got a D are all external to me, right? So when we tend to, when we, when we are making an attribution, when we're attributing reasons for doing good things or for being good it's makes us look good we make ourselves look good when we're coming up with attributions or reasons for bad things that happen to us well we try to make ourselves look as good as possible right and we explain away the bad things to the outside world right so i you know 
I, uh, I drive like really fast. I like to drive fast. Uh, I just do. Right. And I, and I know that sucks, but I'm the asshole going 90 miles an hour down I-10 towards San Antonio. So you're the guy who tailgates me when I'm, I'm the, going at least five miles per hour over the speed that's limit. That's exactly the part I'm getting to. <laughs> <laughs> so, so here I am, right? I'm racing along, right? And there's, you know, here's Reagan in the, you know, left-hand <laughs> lane, camped out in the fucking left. No, no offense. I'm going to leave because uh, this really gets me hot. So uh -huh. <laughs> camped out yeah. in the fucking left-hand lane, right? You know, and, and the speed limit's like 60 there, right? But she's, and she's going 65, right? And she's like, oh, I'm cool, right? Because I'm like, a... and, and here I come barreling down, right? And I, I'm like, you know, this far away from her rear bumper, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Flashing my lights, right? I do that. I, I flash my lights. <laughs> and then after, yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know. I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not proud of this. Okay. Wow. So then after, after a while, Reagan does not move out of the way. So I scoot over, speed by, and then, and continue on. Right. So my attribution of Reagan, what is my attribution of Reagan? Right. What am I thinking? Well, this dumb, <laughs> idiotic moron no offense right, right? <laughs> I, I know like, you don't really think I, i'm like the smartest one yeah, is, is, is like you know ha, you know just too dumb to know to move out of the way you know it's it's all like bad attributions right to that person it's you know nothing to me right now what if i'm but what if so what if like uh so whenever i used to teach on campus right uh, I would get out of teaching my class like at 10 o'clock, you know, and sometimes later if, uh, you know, if um, somebody, if students wanted to talk, right. So I'm, you know, crawling into my car at 1030 over there at Tambusa and it's like a, you know, 45 minute drive home and I'm fucking exhausted. I'm tired as hell. So I'm driving along on the, on the freeway and I'm not paying attention. I'm going like 50 miles an hour, right. And I'm not paying attention which lane I'm in, right? And then I scoot over into the left lane and I'm there cruising at 50 miles an hour, right? All of a sudden, what's the explanation for Ray being in the left lane at 50 miles an hour versus Reagan? So for her, for my, my attributions to her were all internal, bad attributions internal, right? Am I going to make the same attributions about myself? No, 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 no. I'm going to say, oh, it's because I was tired. I wasn't paying attention. You know, it was a long day. You know, I'm going to make every excuse to make myself look better, right? Even though that we had the exact same situation. And that is what a self-serving bias is. And that's what self-serving attributions are. Self-serving attributions are the tendency for us to make attributions or, or, or identify reasons why, um, you know, why we did something good or why we did something bad and it's always to make ourselves look better <laughs> what god i tell you one of the most like classic examples of this is the tendon the tendency for everybody to think they're above average in anything okay the tendency to think you're above so if i were to ask you guys like uh, in terms of your work ethic, would you say that you're, you're below average, average, or above average? And, Way below average. <laughs> well, okay, you know, let's pick something else, but, you know, uh, or your driving skills, right? Driving skills, um, intelligence, uh, looks. It, it turns out whenever you ask a big group of people these questions, 80 or 90 percent of them will say they're above average <laughs> you know and you think about it right how can everybody be above average how is that even that's not possible right if you know if you understand what an average is right which is the middle and then you have like uh, then you have the bell curve right and uh you know there's people that are average there's people that are below average they suck at whatever it is you're measuring and then there's people that are above average right um, one of the things that people will do, especially on subjective types of things, like for example, um, you know, uh, uh, uh physical attractiveness, uh, uh, um, intelligence, uh, those sorts of things where, you know, there's a little bit of judgment there. Um, 
people would tend to, most people would tend to rate themselves as above average. And, you know, you'll have like, you know, uh, you'll even have a significant portion of people rating themselves like in the top 1% of whatever, right? <laughs> you know, and it's, 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 it's ridiculous, but people do that. And that's one of the things you have to look out for is the fact that, um, uh, you know, whenever, I mean, the bottom line is that self reports, whenever you're asking people for to, to assess themselves in some way, um, they're not, they're not accurate. Uh, they're really not accurate. Um, I think, I mean, let, let me ask you guys, do any of you think that you're above average in some quality? What, what quality would that be? Do you think you're a really good writer, driver? good at mm, above average in math looks or do you think you're above average in looks Emmanuel I know Emmanuel is right so he, he, <laughs> he's, he, he's you know he's off the charts right so so uh so other than but other than Emmanuel right other than I, I guess I'd, I'd say I'm probably a, I think of myself as above average in intelligence yeah, a lot of people do. Yeah, a lot of people, especially, you know, especially obnoxious teenagers, you know, like when you're, when you're about 15, and you're, you're just getting that self awareness. Have you ever met that teenager that thinks they're just like, you know, the shit, and they just think they know everything? And, My brother. Yeah, that I mean, that's, that's the way they are. And the reason for that is because they really don't have any baseline to compare themselves to, right? They think, oh, my God, my mind, you know, my mind is the most magnificent mind ever. I think of things that nobody else thinks of, right? <laughs> it's like, well, no, you know, everybody's thinking the same damn thing, right? I mean, it's amazing how uh, much the same we are, right? Uh, you know, there's an old joke. Uh, I think it's in your book somewhere, but it's like, uh, uh, yeah, here it is right here. Always remember that you are absolutely unique, just like everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> you know that's a really good summation of 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 some of this but um one of the uh one of the really interesting ef effects that we get from our self-serving bias is something called the barnum effect b a r n u m barnum effect and the barnum effect is named after p t barnum a, a man named p t barnum i don't know if any of you've heard of p t barnum p t barnum was one of the founders of the barnum and bailey circus and he was famous for saying, there's a sucker born every minute. In other words, you know, <laughs> I can fool people and I can get their money. So, and he, and that's what, that was what he did. That's how he, you know, that's how he became famous other than making a, creating the, getting together with the Ringling Brothers and making this circus that's still around, I think. But um, the Barnum effect is this, whenever you hear, uh, whenever you're given an assessment of yourself that's positive, uh, you tend, you will accept that assessment. And if you're giving an, given an assessment of yourself that's negative, you will tend to not very much agree with it. Now, the people who take advantage of the Barnum effect, remember, it's, this is about suckers, right? People that are suckered. The people that take advantage of the Barnum effect are people like astrologists, tarot card readers, and palm readers, uh, you know, if you ever, you know, if you go, you know, go into the west side of San Antonio, go find yourself a little botanica, you know, with, you know <laughs> Monica's like, no, <laughs> no, don't do it. Don't no. do it. <laughs> well, tell me why, Monica, why do you, why do you say that? Because they'll take your money, right? That too. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God. Yeah. I tell you, it's, 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 it's a, uh, it's, you know, it's part of the Mexican culture. Right. But uh, you, you know, you can have, you can have an egg run over you to, re, re, to cure yourself of diseases and uh, you know, get some different sprays and, and chemicals for all kinds of like love and wealth. And, you know, but anyway, if you, if you go, if you go to like a, like a, like a tarot card reader or something, they're going to give you, you know, they're going to be, they're going to be feeding you a bunch of, you know, information, right? And they're going to tell you exactly what you want to hear. <laughs> they're going to tell you exactly what you want to hear. A lot from just, Rosie, Rosie. well, listening to you, right? Kind of listening to you and talking to you, looking at your reactions to things. And they're going to give you like this, you know, wonderful reading or wonderful explanation for why you're in the situation that you're in, right? Um, now, it's going to be much more um, accepted by you if you believe, if you're told 
that this is a custom made reading for you. In other words, I'm doing this for you. Ra you know, rather than just reading like the, the, the newspaper or horoscope, you know, you go to the, you know, you, you, you know, you, you, you can pull up your horoscope online and it says, you know, today will be a lucky day for you. A friend is thinking about you and, you know, and uh, be sure to button up. It's going to be a little chilly tonight, you know, something like that. And, um, you know, that's kind of generic. You're like, nah. But if you're sitting in front of a tarot card reader that's like actually like working with you, you know, you're suckered in right there. They know that as soon as you walk through that door, they've got you, right? They've got you. That's why you hear all these stories about these people that have like lost, you know, thousands of dollars by calling these, uh, these psychic hotlines on their cell phones, you know, and they don't realize that the cell phone companies like basically bill you like, you know, $20 an hour for every time you call these places. <laughs> You know, there's these stories of these these people that run up like five, six, seven thousand uh, dollar <laughs> cell phone bills because they're talking to their psychic uh, advisor or whatever. Uh, that still happens to this day. That that was a joke back in the '90s, but it still happens to this day because, again, of the self-serving bias, the just strong desire that we have for wanting to. Um, uh, hear good things about ourselves and believe good things about ourselves, right? Um, one of the, uh, one of the related aspects of, um, I guess of, of, uh, I guess it's related to attitudes really is, um, optimism, optimism. Now I learned fairly late in life. I think when I was about 40, that uh, optimism is pretty good. You, you, you need to have a certain amount of optimism in order to be a happy person. Now, now, what about if that optimism goes off the chart? Okay, Un, as it says in your book on page 47, right? Unrealistic optimism, right? Um, humans in general are optimistic, believe it or not. Um, in for the most part and you know optimism is pretty good because one of, one of the things that i learned about optimism is that it helps you to persevere it helps you to keep going um i don't know if i don't know if i well, well i'll tell the story um so <laughs> i'll tell you the way i learned about optimism uh was uh it was this was um back in 90 i guess 98 i guess and I was working, I was a consultant and I was working for a company called EDS, uh, Electronic Data Systems. And it was a huge technology company uh, founded by Ross Perot, that little crazy guy that ran for president, you know, back in the eighties or whatever. And um, that's how he made his billions was founding EDS. Anyway, and um, so I was working for EDS and I was working for the military and I was like a, I was a, I, I contracted with a lot of gigs with the, with the military. And this, this particular gig, I was working in Corpus Christi at the army depot. Now there's a huge army depot in Corpus Christi. And for those of you who don't know, it's, it's a massive, it's, and there's a naval base right next to it, but they are at the army depot there. They repair helicopters and that's where the military uh, does their maintenance uh, work on all the helicopters. So I was working over there and it was this huge, massive facility, gigantic, like, you know, massive building. And we were like in the middle of this building in this little tiny office, like up on stilts, you know, in this, in this building. And there was like, you know, five of us consultants crammed into this office and it was hot and it was uncomfortable, but the team was awesome. Um, so anyway, every morning this uh, guy would come in to empty the trash cans. Now this guy, he was um, uh, mentally challenged and it, he was, he was, I guess it was like, like a program they had to have like, um, um, you know, uh, special needs, mentally challenged people to give them jobs. Right. So his job was to empty the trash cans and he, he'd come in every morning. He'd be like, and he was always such a happy guy. Always. He'd come in, he'd say, good morning, Dr. Lopez. How are you? And I wish I could remember his name. I don't remember his name. And, and he said, oh, I'd say, okay, Joe, how, how are you doing? Go. Oh. And he, every time you asked him what he was doing, he always gave the same answer. He'd say, another day, another dollar. <laughs> he would just say it like that. Another day, another dollar. And he was like this little Hispanic guy, you know, and, and, and you could tell he was like, 
you know, he, he had special needs and he always wore his hat kind of crooked, real cute little guy, right? And then he said, good morning, Mr. Rhodes, how are you? And, oh, I'm okay, Joe, how are you? Another day, another dollar. You know, he'd do that, and, and he'd empty all the trash, and then after when he's leaving, he'd say, okay, goodbye, goodbye, Mr. Uh, Mr. Rhodes, goodbye, Dr. Lopez, it's good to see you, and then he'd leave, right? I was like, you know, and I, you know, he came in like this all the time, all happy and, and shit, you know, I'm like, and at the time I was a miserable, despicable fuck. I mean, I was like, I, I, you know, I, I, I was depressed. I weighed over 300 pounds. Um, so I'm getting pretty close to that again, by the way, but, um, I, sm I was smoked, you know, I was just, I was just a miserable piece of shit, but, um, so one day, um, you know, in the afternoon, they wouldn't let you smoke on the facility. So I always, I had to go out to my car to smoke, which was like literally like a 20 minute walk. Right. So, so one day I'm like, I go down the little stairs and I'm walking across the, the workshop, the work area. And I go outside and I work and, and I go outside and I'm walking toward the street to go, to go across to my car. And I see this guy, this, I think I'm going to call him Joe because I can't remember his name, but he's there with all his other peeps, you know, all the other special needs people. And he's at the bus stop. I think they were waiting for the bus to pick him up. They all had their little lunch bags and, you know, they're all their way. And he was like the center of a discussion. And he, they were, everybody was just so happy and, and, and it just, you know, laughing and they were joking around and, and, and I, something, I don't know what it was, but something hit me and I was like, oh my God, you know, it's like, it really matters how you interact with people and that positivity really affects other people. Um, and it just was like, I don't know, it's hard for me to explain, but it was like this revelation that, that struck me that about the power of being positive. And, and at first I tried to fight it. I was like, nah, it's just cause you know, they're, they're retarded and they don't know. Right. That, you know, but no, that's not it. That, that really can't be it. I mean, they, they, those people were genuinely like really happy. <laughs> they were really like, really, you know, and it was real clear that this guy, Joe was like uh, providing that happiness to them. So that's how, kind of how I learned, you know, from a special needs person. So you can learn from everybody. I always tell people you can learn from everybody. Right. <laughs> Uh, that's how I learned how being optimistic is is really much better way to live than being very pessimistic, right? Um, but you can go overboard with the optimism. People that are overly optimistic uh, tend to be put themselves in dangerous situations, right? If you're not careful, right? I mean, think about it. What if you're what if you're a super overly optimistic 19 year old girl, and you're going around having lots of sex, and you think, oh, I won't get pregnant, I won't get a disease. <laughs> what's going to happen to you, right? That's not a, that's not a good way to live, right? Um, so being, you know, being overly optimistic is, is not bad. One of the terms, or is bad, is bad, I should say. One of the terms that they've come up with of, uh, to sort of talk about this balance between optimism and pep, optimism and pessimism is what, what they refer to as defensive pessimism, defensive pessimism. And that's basically um, when you can actually anticipate pr your problems and harness that anxiety to um, motivate yourself to action, right? Um, you know, uh, for example, like, so I've just over the last few weeks or whatever, so I got a, a big, um, uh, promotion at my day job at IBM and I'm now I got put in charge of a lot of shit <laughs> I mean, a lot of shit. people and I, I got all kinds of things going on now and I'm uh, it's freak I'll be uh, it's freaking me the fuck out it really is I'm like oh my god can I do this um, now you know if I was like an ultimate pessimist like I used to be I'd be like no I can't do this right um, as a matter of fact I'll probably handicap myself some way and fail right uh but what instead what i've done i'm pretty optimistic i think i can rise to the challenge but i do have this defensive pessimism right i'm like okay if i don't get my shit together right if i don't get my shit together and communicate my job is basically communicating with people i'm on the phone like all day and you know but if I don't communicate, if I don't communicate, 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 uh, I'm going to fail. So I need to be really good about communicating. I need to be good about taking notes at meetings. I need to make, make sure I follow up for my notes and my, you know, that I take. 
you know, make my action items so that I can make sure that I'm uh, doing everything. Whenever I talk to my employees, the people that work for me, I need to make sure I'm clear on what they're doing and what they need. And so I just really, you know, it really caused me when I found out I was getting this job, I really caused me to, you know, rethink how I do things uh, and to be more disciplined about how I do things. Uh, but that's defensive pes pessimism, right? Another aspect of, well, before, you know, before I go on, does anybody, oh, um, let's see. Oh, there's, there's tests. Oh, okay. So everybody's, uh, everybody's, okay, asking questions here. Okay, cool. Um, no, you're not going to have one of those monitor things uh, for the tests. No, no. <laughs> I, I, uh, uh, I've heard too many bad things about those things. So, um, so just be honest. <laughs> don't, don't cheat. Okay? <laughs> God is watching you. <laughs> like when you touch yourself, God is watching you. <laughs> uh, anyway, okay. Um, <laughs> so, um, <laughs> does anybody have any questions or comments about any? Um, anything I've covered so far. We're, again, we're talking now about, you know, our, our perceptions of ourselves and how, uh, you know, a change is based on the, on, on the situation. Um, another misperception that we have about ourselves, right? You know, you know we had, we talked about, over, you know, being overly optimistic. We talked about, uh, uh, you know, thinking we're better than average and the self-serving bias. Well, another misperception that a lot of people have is called the false consensus effect, the false consensus effect. And this is the tendency to overestimate how common your opinions and beliefs are. The tendency to overestimate how common your beliefs and opinions are, right? So like, you know, I'm, you know, I'll say, well, you know, Donald Trump is a stupid ass, right? He's a stupid, arrogant jackass, right? I'm thinking, of course you all agree with me. Of course you do, right? I, you know, who, I, I know you're, you're all above average in intelligence. So uh, <laughs> of course you agree with me, right? And, you know, there's probably some people sitting there going, oh, no, I don't know. You know, I can't. I kind of like him. I think he's doing good for the country. <laughs> you know, um, so, and but but the tendency for us to think that everybody agrees with us is is the, is the false is the false consensus effect, right? Um, related to that is the false uniqueness effect. The false uniqueness effect, and that's the tendency to underestimate the commonality of your abil abilities underestimate how common your abilities are right so you know going back to that person who thinks they're like just a super genius right I, I cannot tell you how many um how many kids i've known you know how many students i've had over the years as you know undergraduates who kind of had this like they thought they were the shit right that they were all that you know they were like you know i'm I'm brilliant. They were, they were kind of arrogant. Right. Yeah. And they think they're really special. Right. Cause they're the, you know, they're the big fish in a small pond, right. They're going to UTSA and, and they're like, Oh, I'm so, I'm just brilliant. Right. And then, and then they, and then they end up going to graduate school. The few of them that do go to end up in the graduate school at a, to an Ivy league school. So they'll, they'll end up, you know, going to Harvard or Yale or Stanford and, you know, I see them, you know, like on Facebook or even face to face sometimes a few years later and they're, they have been significantly humbled. Right? <laughs> They've definitely been knocked down a few notches. Right. You know, why is that? Because, well, when, you know, you go to someplace like Harvard university, right. Everybody's smart. Like everybody's an overachiever. Everybody's smart. You know, there's no, you know, there's nothing, you know, there's no, there's nobody there that's an underachiever and, and, and not smart. Right. And, you know, and you're, you're like, Oh, okay. I mean, I learned, I learned that myself working at IBM, you know, uh, at IBM, everybody's smart. <laughs> you know? 
every I was always used to being like the smartest guy in the room, right? And I was like, I was probably a little arrogant about it, right, when I was a kid. But uh, man, you go to some place like IBM, and like I'm I am no longer the smartest guy in the room, <laughs> and that's okay, right? That's cool. I like that because that's how you learn, right? That's how you learn. Uh, there's there's a saying that I like that says, uh, if you're the smartest person in the room, it's time to find another room, right? Because you're not going to learn anything from being the smartest person in the room, right? But the false uniqueness effect, a lot of people suffer from that, right? They think, oh, well, you know, I, you know, I'm just, I'm really brilliant or I have exceptional people skills or, you know, there's so, there's something to that, right? Um, well, what, what, um, what motivates all this, right? So we have these, now we know we have these biased perceptions Right. We have these biased perceptions about ourselves. Um, where does it come from? What's the motive? Well, the, the really sad thing is we really, we really don't know. Um, the, there's many motives. There's many, there's many motives. Um, you know, maybe we're trying to enhance our self image Maybe we're trying to verify our beliefs. Maybe we are, um, uh, we're trying to assess ourselves relative to others. See how we, you know, really, you know, especially in a very competitive job, for example, right? So that, you know, it really depends on the situation and a little bit on your personality. Um, what the motivations are for, you know, for all these, you know, you know ridiculous uh, misperceptions that we tend to have about ourselves, right? Um, was there any, any questions or comments about that? Oh, I hear a baby. I heard a child, right? Does the my child, have, does, I thought I muted it, my bad. Does, does, Megan, does your child have a question about, uh, her self-esteem or, okay. I'm trying to get the cat in. <laughs> well, sorry, my bad. Everybody well, no, let, let, I you see, no, no, Megan, what you do, what you do is you let her do her thing, right? Figure, and then her self-efficacy will grow up as she grows up. So you want to, you want to make sure she has good self-efficacy. There you go. She's got that. I think she like glued the the blinds to the window or something throughout this lecture. I don't know. She's doing her thing back there. Sorry, y'all. So she has a little bit too much self-efficacy. Yeah, I would say so for sure. Well, she's probably smart like her mama. So, you know. I don't know about that. But um, yeah, sorry about that. I thought no, I needed no it. Problem. Sorry, no, no problem. No problem. Uh, anybody else? Anybody have any questions or comments about... Um, all of these uh, self delusions and self. Uh, well, how much does the uh, ego come into play? With well, this? That, I think I think that's that's a really good question. I think I think that's it's one of the it's one of the um, it's one of the motivators. You know, when 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 I said that we don't really know what some of the causes are of these, um, you know, of these um, all these biases. I think some of them, some of the time, result from a desire to protect yourself, to protect your ego. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think, I think that's true, especially if you've uh, been raised in a situation where your ego was damaged, right? You're going to do, you're going to be doing a lot more to protect your ego than other people would. Does that make sense? Yes. Oh, okay. Who is, uh, who, who is I don't know. Right? Uh, I don't oh, know. I'm sorry, Monica. Go ahead. No, you're good. Um, I don't know if it's the same. I'm trying to like read along the book as we go. Um, right. Just to make sure we have. I'm covering everything, but I don't know if it's the same or similar. I wouldn't say um, it has anything to. Well, yeah, I guess. So growing up, I was always um, like school came easy mm -hmm. to me yep. and yep. for me, like rather yep. than compared to like my sisters. Yep. They actually had to work extra hard, study more, do more. And um, I think that it ended up being like a negative yeah. um, thing for me because yeah. high school and everything, I was advanced in math. So I considered myself above average in math or yep. like yep. Um, just in my studies in general. I got accepted to UT and I ended up not doing well at school. I had uh, me, no. Yeah. Um, Tell me what happened at UT. I thought, I don't, and that's weird. Like I didn't even. I I questioned myself. Like why did I think that way? But, and then 
over time figured it out, but mm-hmm. I didn't think I had to maybe like work as hard or still yeah. see as yeah. much or. Yeah. Oh my God. You know, no, listen. And it listen. was not yeah. a, a very unrealistic because. Yeah. No, that story. You have to. That you have story to. Like, how is. How did I not? That story is so, I mean, even when I was at UT, right? So I had mm-hmm. a roommate who uh who i went to high school with and uh my first couple of years that i was there and he ended up flunking out and um you know and i think that was because again he and i in high school were like really smart right and um for us high school was like you know we i i don't think i studied at all in high school <laughs> i mean maybe a little but um, yeah. and, and, and then I go to UT, but so I realized, you know, for me, I was like, oh my God, this is like the hardest fucking thing I've ever done. For me, it was like really hard. Um, and it is, I mean, UT is a very, very tough school. They call it a public Ivy, which means you get the same experience that you do at an Ivy league school, but at a public school price. And so, I mean, I, I, you know, my first semester, my first semester, I had my, I had a 2.0 GPA because I made like straight C's in every class I took. <laughs> and that's when I thought, you know, a C is passing. <laughs> so, yeah, know. like, I was like, wait, what? You have to have a C okay. plus to get credit? Like, yeah, oh my gosh. I mean, I was just busting my ass, you know, it was horrible. But um, there's so many, I had, there were so many friends of ours that were, in the, that were exactly like that, right? So that, you know, they came in and they thought, oh, I, you know, I'm, a, I, they, their assessment, their their self assessment mm-hmm. was that I'm above average. I've always been above average. I've always been the smartest person in the room. You know, bam, and then they kind well, of. I didn't like, think I was the smartest. Yeah, exactly. Definitely didn't think I had to like yeah. do so much. No, that, that, thanks for sharing. But that. the work Just, ethic and all of that was uh, definitely challenged, and oh, I had to yeah. change a whole, like, years of. Yeah, uh, you had to right? break all those old habits. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's what uh, my one of my friends told me that uh, he said, you know, because I, I worked at I, uh, I used to have a part time job at Kmart, <laughs> the Kmart on William Cannon and I-35 in Austin, okay. Texas. I, I think it's a Burlington Coat factory. now. But I worked, it was a Kmart store there back in the 80s. And I work in that Kmart store 30 hours a week. You know, I would come I would get home from work like at 10, take a shower and then I'd go study. And, and my roommates were like, fuck <laughs> yeah that yeah. too i had two jobs in yeah <laughs> yeah it's 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 it really is an eye opener uh when, when when these biases like hit you right in the face i mean it and unfortunately a lot of people learn it the hard way like we did you know you're like oh shit you know but you know that's why it's important that you guys sort of internalize this you want to make you want to be aware of your own biases right now you know in all fairness you all of you guys are 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 at, uh, at least at least slightly above average in intelligence you wouldn't be in college if you weren't okay if you were below average in intelligence you would not be here right you'd be somewhere not nice right? <laughs> but, um, but all of you guys because you're in college you're you represent that part of the population that is above average in intelligence. now some of you are more above average than others right um but but uh, so you've got that going for you right <laughs> you are you are somewhat above average in intelligence um so um <clears throat> let's see so all of this right all of this talk about the biases and and um relates a lot to how we present ourselves to the world right so one of the questions that um uh, social psychologists have been dealing with in relation to all of these biases is um what self pre- self presentation self presentation is ba- that's basically the act of expressing yourself and behaving in ways that are designed to create a favorable impression okay or an impression that you want to communicate so expressing yourself and behaving in ways that causes people to have the impression of you that they want all right I mentioned this before, but I, you know, I learned this about teaching, right? You know, I think the one thing that you guys look for in a teacher is competence, right? You want to be assured that this idiot that's, you know, talking in front of you knows what the fuck he's talking about, right? You know, you're, you know, and, I mean, I don't know if you guys have ever had like a bad professor, like somebody who like didn't, <laughs> okay, everybody's like, yeah, 
I mean, somebody who didn't know how to teach, right? And or or didn't sound like they knew what they were talking about, right? I mean, that happens. You know, believe it or not, that happens. And you know, that is, you know, you're you're pissed. You and you know, you're I wasted my money on this class. Yeah, I got my grade, but like I didn't learn anything. I mean, it's just it's not a good experience. And for me personally, I, I find that I would find that offensive if uh, people thought that of me. So I, I work really hard to make sure that um, I'm at least somewhat prepared for class. I know what I'm talking about and, I, and that I sound like I know what I'm talking about. That's the impression that I try to convey. Um, one of the things that people do to manage impressions sometimes, one of the, one of the stupid things that people do is something called self-handicapping. And what people will do is they'll say, okay, you know what, I'm sort of unconsciously, they'll say, you know, I don't think I'm going to be any good at this anyway. So I'm just going to come up with some uh, behavior that allows me to explain my failure. Okay, I'm going to come up with some behavior or excuse that allows me to explain away my behavior, right? So the person that is, uh, you know, the person that is, uh, uh, you know, uh, asked to, you know, ask, you know, hey, let's go play tennis together or let's go golfing together or let's go play handball together. And, uh, you know, the, the one, the, the other person is like, oh, geez, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I suck at everything I try with sports. I, I, uh, uh, well, you know, I got this bad back, uh, you know, uh, yeah, uh know if i'll be able to swing that golf club and it's true right you it's hard to swing a golf club with a bad back right um or uh i had i have a friend um who works with me at ibm and she she uh used to be uh, she she and i used to be on the same team about six years ago and we we, we would teach we taught uh you know classes on on our technology we would go to different uh, client sites all over the world and we would teach and she didn't last very long at it. Uh, she, she and I went on a couple of gigs together. Uh, she, and she went on a gig with uh, somebody else and she didn't last very long at it because uh, she was, uh, she was so terrified of talking in front of people. She just thought that she just wasn't any good at it. She actually was, when she was on, when she was on point, she was extremely good, but uh, she just felt that she didn't have what it took to like deal with like all the questions and whatnot. So she, she self handicapped herself. She would talk about um, how she suffered from PTSD, uh, which she did. She had a pretty abusive childhood, but she would talk about how she suffered from PTSD and how it affected her, uh, her, uh, she felt like she, it, whenever people would question her in class, she felt like she was being attacked and it would trigger her PTSD. So she had this whole like litany of explanations and what she was doing was self handicapping herself basically. And I told her that I was, you know, I, I told her, I said, you're, 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 this is self handicapping. And, and she basically said, I know, <laughs> but, but, but I hate doing this and I don't want to do it anymore. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, so you know but that's what self-handicapping is um one of the huge things that has hit us in the face over the last i guess i don't know five ten years basically in the facebook age in the uh tiktok age in the pinterest age uh in the instagram age is impression management managing your impression to other people. I mean, the number one symbol of a impression management is the fucking selfie, right? The fucking selfie, right? You're like, <laughs> right? And you know why, you know, why do people post selfies? Why I want to hear an answer to this. Well, why do people post selfies? What's what's the what's the thing? Why do I don't you, take selfies. Who who said that? Oh my phone. This first. is Tremaine. Trem oh, that, oh, you're on the phone, Tremaine. Yes. Okay. I thought I I thought I could read. Now, Tremaine, I'm I I got to be honest. I'm surprised to hear you say that. Because people take selfies so they don't have to. You know, they get to show off 
their new pimples and stuff, you know. It's just, they <laughs> well, no, I, I was I was surprised that Tremaine said that. I was because I Tremaine was in my class before, and I know and I know Tremaine. She's she's a, 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 a an attractive woman. <laughs> Tremaine's Tremaine's a very a, a, a pretty lady, and I was like, she just looks like somebody that takes selfies. <laughs> But, but you just said you didn't, Tremaine. Well, let me t t tell me now. When you said that, Tremaine, you were very adamant about like I don't take selfies. Why? Why are you so adamant about that? So I don't take selfies, and I just—I mean, I, I will say this: I probably have taken three selfies, and it's just because of online dating, and they want it, right? Yeah, exactly. So have... yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. But I, I don't get the whole selfie thing. I just learned how to take selfies. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm like in the dark ages about it. I don't know how to do the lighting and to do oh the my. app. See, I'm I like, think it's very, uh, I, you, it's very just, uh, just the impression I had was that you were like an expert at selfies. Cause you, I mean, you're just, no. like, you present yourself very well, in, you know, in, in, in real life. I just thought, well, that's amazing. That's really amazing. I, I, yeah. I, that's interesting. That's really interesting. Oh, you I want to know what the deal about it is because I have friends that literally they have nothing on their wall. Mm -hmm. All they have are selfies. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I'm just trying to figure out, is it like a confidence boost? Well, okay. Is it they want people to like them? Let me ask this. Okay. 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 Time for complete honesty, guys. Okay. Who has, who, who has a lot of selfies on their social media? Uh, who who does who has a lot Sister. okay so uh that would be uh let's see alex i don't oh, i don't know if mine is technically considered a lot Ugh. yeah i don't that's really true. take selfies that much i i really don't i'm kind of introverted i don't really post on social media much anyway i used to a lot more than i do now but so alex alexa so alexa has selfies like i'll i'll take pictures of people or if like i'm trying to show the background like say i'm an enchanted rock or something yeah i'll post yeah. selfies but like i'm not gonna print them out put them on my wall that's <laughs> like i'm not gonna do it <laughs> <laughs> well, let me tell you. So, uh, the, actually, the whole selfie thing—it's a fairly new phenomenon, obviously. And science takes a while to catch up, so it's still being researched. But the, one of the one of the sort of early sorts of findings that I've seen is that uh, people who enjoy—and this there's a paper that that came out on this, I believe, like about a year ago. I posted it in my—I um, think I posted it in my uh, Facebook group. Um, but there is some evidence or actually a lot of evidence that shows that people that like to take a lot of selfies tend to be narcissists a little high on narcissism okay alexa's like <laughs> <laughs> that's why i asked <laughs> well i think there's a difference between <laughs> Thanks. I mean, there's a difference between like taking selfies to remember a fun moment that you had with someone else and you take a yeah like, you take a picture that, you don't necessarily yes. post it because yeah, that's a good point. That's a good, what are we talking about with regard to selfies? Right. Cause like, you know, for example, like I, I traveled a lot when I was a consultant and whenever I would like, and of course, whenever I was at a gig and the gig was over, we would have a big dinner, right. With the, with the team. And I would post pictures of myself with the team, but that's because well, I was, I had made new friends and I really liked these people. And, you know, we had a good time, but uh, I think self to, to Tremaine's point, I think selfies, you know, if it's selfies are like when, you know, and what Tremaine said, you know, like the lighting and putting the filters and getting, I mean, there's people that put a lot of effort into this. But then that's not their, the real person then if they're filtering all that out. Exactly. Well, I think that's the point yep. too. That, and that's part, that, that is exactly part of impression management. That is exactly the part of impression management that is of most interest to social psychologists. Yeah, I think there's a huge difference between taking a group picture and you just so happen to be the person who's taking it of a group of people. Yeah. A truth is yourself, yeah. like yeah. one person, like just I'm, you of yourself. Yeah. Like I've taken and selfies you, to send to people who are like long distance away from me oh, that yeah. I care about. Exactly. Yeah, I've done That's that the, too. I mean, about that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's on Facebook. That's what we're talking about. <laughs> yeah, or or or, uh, or I think um, uh, Instagram. I think is the selfie, mm -hmm. you know, capital of the universe, yeah. right? All right, but I'm not 
the only one that takes selfies because I'm sure half of y'all have probably sent nudes before. Those count as selfies. Yeah, they do. Not. They do. I'm not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I did. I did put an article by. I did find an article that I put in my Facebook page about people's reaction to unsolicited dick pics. There is a, there's a, there was a study that was done on that. So, oh no! Just FYI, you know, in case you were wondering. I wasn't, but thank you anyway. <laughs> I would say it's the same, like, because I'm I do both. Like, I'll take selfies, and then I'll also like not like i think that okay if i took it once and i don't like it that's it like i'm yeah, not gonna try yeah. to worry about taking like a hundred until i get the perfect one like i like be done with it dismiss it like it's done yeah. um shoot if i think i look good i'm posting it yeah if I don't <laughs> then i'm not yeah. and i think we all do that I, I i feel like it's the same as why do you post your new car or yeah. your new house yeah, exactly yeah or all yeah. the or other your accomplishments yeah, because exactly. you want yeah, the yeah. congratulations. Well, you want the, that, yeah, you you want the, you want the compliments or the reassurance yeah, exactly. that I'm exactly. doing good or the reassurance that I look good. Exactly. Right? No, that's that's true. That's true. Absolutely. I, you know, I think the last selfie I posted, whew, long time, probably a long time ago, probably fifty pounds ago. Um, <laughs> was, uh, you know, I, you know, I I had a suit. You know, I had like this nice suit, and I was like, you know, I had my you know I had my Rolex. I'm all like, you know sexy motherfucker right so i'm like <laughs> yeah i did a selfie i thought i looked i thought i looked gorgeous right i mean i didn't but i thought i did right <laughs> but yeah um so it, it's it, but it's all about impression now one of the important things about impression management that a lot of the selfie uh, people tend to forget is that one of, fundamentally one of the goals of impression management obviously is to make yourself look good but not too good Okay, mm -hmm. you can go overboard and make yourself look too good. Uh, and you guys know what that's like, right? The people that go overboard to make themselves look extremely successful, yeah. extremely wealthy, extremely attractive, having the best, you know, they're posting pictures of themselves, you know, like, you know, snowboarding in Colorado, then traveling to Paris for dinner. And they're we are taking pictures of themselves with all these gorgeous people. Those people. And then are, it's actually like a really boring or something. Yeah. Know. And they're obnoxious. <laughs> these, th those kinds of people are obnoxious. Right. Uh, you know, I, I learned to avoid that because I would literally travel to three different cities in the world in a month. Uh, when I was really traveling a lot. And you know, after a while, I thought, you know what, I'm not going to post any more pictures of my travels on Facebook, because then people are going to, it's, it's obnoxious, you know, here, oh, here I am in Berlin, Germany, <laughs> tomorrow I'll be in Zurich, Switzerland, you know, it's like, no, that looks really obnoxious. Dude, I learned to stop, like, to not post about my vacations and stuff, well, A, because my parents were paranoid about people knowing that we weren't home, but also because, like, I don't want other people butting in on my vacation. I'm not having this vacation for other people. Yeah. I'm having it to rest well, and relax. Yeah, that's actually a good point. You know, they say you shouldn't talk about your vacation on social media until after the fact, if you if you do want to share anything about it. Because if people know on your vacation, that's actually a lot of information that you probably don't want people to know, right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, I also, I think, like, you also can't control, like, I think, I feel like there's something wrong with posting, like, um, like travel places or whatever, right? Or things you're doing. I don't know. But if it, I feel like it's also like you can't control the person's um, reactions, like yeah. people's reactions too. It's like, oh, well, that's your problem if you're reacting like exactly. negatively. Exactly. Towards. Yeah. Oh, and you when see that you see that all the time, right? right? You know, yeah. You see those those fi those uh, firestorms that break out on people's uh, Facebook walls. You know, when they're yeah. nasty when they're nasty about things. Um, so this and this you know this this talk about impression management leads us to talk about a, a an important personality trait there's a there's a personality trait that is called self monitoring self monitoring and that is the degree to which you monitor your impressions that you're giving to others and then adjusting your behavior to match the situation that you're in monitoring your behaviors and influences on others your impression the impressions that others have on you and then adjusting yourself these people that are self-monitors right people that are self-monitors 
Um, one of the terms that's used to describe people that are high in self-monitoring is a social chameleon, a social chameleon. You know, they'll, you know, the, you know, if they're, if they're like in a group, uh, let's say they're interacting with a group of geeks, right. That are like really, you know, computer geeks. Right. So they'll adjust their, you know, their, their body language and their mannerisms and their, and their speech to match with that. And then let's say they get in with a group of frat boys, right? Well, they'll adjust their body language and their language and all that to deal with them, right? If that's what somebody in very high self-monitoring will do. They'll, they'll just constantly be changing their personality or their uh, the, the vibe that they give out, the impression that they leave based on the situation. Now, somebody low in self-monitoring is the exact opposite. They act the same no matter what, <laughs> right? No matter what. Uh, you know, this is my, my wife, my wife, my, my wife has like zero self, like none. <laughs> she's just like, she's the same, no matter what situation she's in. Right. Um, I don't know. There's a guy named, uh, that I don't know if you guys have heard of a, he's an old, uh, a comedian named Larry David. Have you ever heard of Larry David? Yeah. He's uh, he has a show on HBO called Curb Your Enthusiasm. And he was actually one of the guys who created the Seinfeld show back in the uh, 80s and 90s and made billions of dollars and if you've never seen Larry David he's just uh, he, he's like a uh, an uptight obnoxious Jew <laughs> it's basically him and uh, he uh, you know he's he has like no self-monitoring whatsoever people say that the Larry David you see on TV is the exact Larry David that you get when you know him face to face, he just, he doesn't, he doesn't change his behaviors or his impression, no matter who he's talking to. And of course that can come across as being obnoxious sometimes, right? If you're not adjusting yourself <laughs> with the situation, um, you can come across. I as know. Being I don't agree. Um, I, I don't think so. I'm the, I'm the same person. If I'm at work, if you come to my house, if I see you in the each Well, that's because that's because Tremaine, you're not an obnoxious person. You're not by, oh. de by definition. You're not obnoxious. Now, if you were obnoxious and but you never changed that because of the social situation, that would be a problem. That would be a problem. But see, you're you're just generally a decent person. Like you wouldn't you know, like you wouldn't think about like saying things to hurt to hurt people, for example, right? Um, and and that's good. I mean, I think for you to have low self monitoring is probably a good thing. Uh, because you, you are in general a decent person. But if you're somebody like Larry David, who's just an awful person, who, you know, and you have no self-monitoring skills, that's not, that's not a good thing, right? Um, but uh, th th yeah, so if you've never heard of Larry David, go to YouTube and just Google Larry, or do a search for Larry David on YouTube. You'll find lots of videos of, of him on current Curb Your Enthusiasm being really obnoxious. But uh, Anyway, um, that's it for chapter two. The last part of chapter two talks about self-control, um, something which I know absolutely nothing about. No, just kidding. Uh, self-control is hard. Uh, and, you know, self-control is harder when you have depleted uh, your cognitive resources. I don't know if you've ever, you know, th so those of you that have had uh, struggled with weight, problems like you know <laughs> right here <laughs> you know right you work all day right you work all day all day long you're tired as hell and then you come home and are you really up for thinking about you know counting your calories counting your points making sure you know you're staying within your you know allotted you know weight watchers points you know no, it, it, that takes too much cognitive energy. We, t we tend to fail in self-control if we've expended a lot of cognitive energy, um, which still doesn't explain my lack of self-control. <laughs> but in general, that's, that's one of the, the theories behind it. But anyway, that's chapter two. And we're a little over time, but since this is a, you know online thing anyway, no big deal. Uh, does anyone have any questions or comments? I see a child has appeared on the... On the screen, Alexa, Alexa, uh, Victoria. Okay. Hello, cousin. Um, wait. Um, can I speak, like, um, after? Like, yeah, after everybody disappears. Yeah. yeah. You want to chat yeah. with me? Sure, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, I that's it. With that. I'll, I'll clear out. <laughs> I'm sorry. Next question. Did, uh,
Monica, did you have a question? Or? Yes, for the exam, um, I know last week or last time you mentioned about like in our book to look over like the headings. Is it the headings or like our definitions? Yeah, look at the look at the headings and the and the little definitions on the side, the bold text. Just kind of like get a get a spot check, you know, before the lecture. That helps a lot. Okay. That does help a lot. Don't spend more than 20 minutes doing it. And yeah, I saw somebody ask about the test. Yeah, the test will cover chapters one and three. We are on schedule to finish up. Uh, we do have the Labor Day holiday coming up, uh, but we have three more lectures left before the first test. And I will, I'll give you all the details on the test. You don't have to worry about that. You'll have all the details about how to sign into it. And it's in Blackboard. So if you've ever taken a test on Blackboard before, you're okay. So it's just multiple choice. So no need to worry about that. I didn't pick on uh, Ashley today, so <laughs> I was like, I was gonna say, I bet she's the selfie queen of the world, right there. Right? <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, if nobody else has any questions or comments, I'll see you guys uh, Wednesday, right? Wednesday. All right. So have a good evening. You too. Thank you. Thank Bye, you. Tremaine. Bye. And I'll hang out for Victoria here. And let's see. Uh, let me move this person. Oh, let me turn off the recording. <laughs>